So this week, uh, we are going to talk or begin talking about the international dimension of macroeconomics, the connections between a national economy and the rest of the world, uh, which is really of central importance for most economies, perhaps less central for the United States, but still, uh, still, still very, very important for the US as well. So in this lecture, I wanna talk about the basic sort of accounting, the sort of descriptive side of the international dimension of macroeconomics before moving on in subsequent lectures to uh, the, the sort of causal stories that we like to tell about the linkages between one economy and the rest of the world. And um, the accounting, the descriptions that we use for, for, for the various payments between one economy and the rest of the world are, um, referred to in a generic way as the balance of payments. Balance of payments accounting describes in principle all of the economic transactions that cross the national border. So if we're thinking about the sort of linkages between one economy and another in a most, this is it's sort of the most generic way, um, we have we have two two sets of linkages connecting economies with 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 each other across borders. Um, one is is trade flows, uh, exports, which we typically abbreviate as X, and imports, which we typically abbreviate as M. Exports, of course, being goods from this country that are purchased by somebody in the rest of the world, and imports being goods produced elsewhere in the world that are purchased in this country. Um, so that's, uh, as we'll see, you know, sort of half of our balance of payments in a sort of rough way is, is accounted for by, by these trade flows here. Um, the, other, the other half of the sort of uh, international payments are, are financial flows, uh, which include both, uh, in a, in a, I call it financial inflows, it's a little imprecise we, because we're grouping in here, you know, a couple of different things. Um, income payments to and from the rest of the world, profits, interest payments, and so on that cross national borders, and financial transactions in, in the strict sense, which are purchases and sales of assets and uh, the, the um, uh, um, new loans being made and, and, and old loans being paid off, uh, financial transactions. But we can group that stuff together. And together, these things constitute the balance of payments which is a central target, a central concern for policymakers in, um, in, in much of the world. Um, uh, again, not, not so much today, at least the United States, but almost everywhere else to some degree, at least, the balance of payments is something that, that, that policymakers have to be concerned with, which, by which we simply mean the net payments across the border. Um, there's an older usage in which we think of the balance of payments as actually having a value, a balance. In the old days of the gold standard, we could think of the balance of payments in some sense as the amount of gold flowing in or out of the country. So that if a country has a trade surplus, that's going to tend to bring more gold into the country. And foreign payments into our country, either foreign loans, foreign purchase of our assets, or foreign uh, interest or profit payments that we receive as a consequence of our assets abroad, all of that stuff we could think of conceptually as bringing gold into our country. Now, of course, we no longer live in a gold standard world. There is no single international asset that functions um, as a sort of international money, although for, for much of the world, the dollar does in some sense, but certainly not for the United States and not um, entirely uh, for the rest of the world either. So uh, it's harder in many cases to think, well, what is, what is this balance? But nonetheless, a country that faces a situation where in general people are trying to make more payments out of the country than, than people want to make into the country is going to have a problem of one form or another and is probably going to have to make some sort of adjustment to deal with that. So this, this, that's, that's the balance of payments as a policy target. And, and over and over again in recent decades, we've seen countries um, experience crises because of balance of payments problems or feel compelled to adopt uh, policies that they might otherwise have definitely not wanted to in order to manage their balance of payments. But that's that's for a future lecture. Today we're just concerned about the accounting. And the last thing I want to mention in this in this this little flowchart is the the important role of the exchange rate here. The exchange rate is both um, 
is 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 uh, an important factor determining uh, trade flows, although that's not quite as straightforward as people sometimes make it out to be. And it also has a big effect on the international investment position. So the international investment position is, in principle, the equivalent of a balance sheet at the level of a national economy. It's the adding up of all of the assets in the rest of the world owned by entities, units, people, businesses, governments, owned by, by units in our economy. And um, uh, minus, of course, all of the assets in our economy that are owned by units in the rest of the world. So in some sense, the international investment position, if it's positive, the country is a net creditor. If it's negative, the country is a net debtor. So our international transactions, broadly speaking, uh, broadly speaking, we, we have what we call the current account and the financial account. Balance of payments, or, or now they, the, the BA has changed it to the um, uh, international transactions account. It's a, it's a little less um, evocative than balance of payments, but that's what they call it officially now, the international transactions account. Broadly speaking, we have the current account, the capital account, and the financial account. And here I have to pause and, and say there's a sort of annoying bit of nomenclature change here, which is that what we today call the financial account was called, you know, until 10 or 20 years ago, the capital account. So if you read older articles in economics or people or articles by older people who haven't adapted to the, the new, uh, new terminology, you'll often see them use the term capital account to today mean uh, what we today call the financial account. Well, all right, I'm going to come back in a little, in a moment and explain exactly what these things are. Let's focus for now on the current account. Uh, the current account is, is, as it suggests, payments being made in the current period that don't directly have any consequences in future periods. Payments that don't involve any changes of ownership. So we can break those down in, in the most general way. Into trade payments. And income payments where income includes things like interest payments across borders, dividends across borders, foreign aid, remittances, all sorts of things where there's a payment being made in this period that doesn't have any corresponding um, uh, any, 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 anything being given you know, in return for it. Um, so the way this connects up, and I wanted the way this connects up to our sort of standard national accounts is, is like this. Um, we have a concept called G NP. This, this incidentally was used to be the standard measure of sort of the size of the economy. Today we see GDP, but, but um, historically the term that was used was um, GNP for it, with the N standing for national. While GDP is a measure of uh, all of the goods and services produced in this country in the period of time, Gross national product is, is the measure of the total income from production in this country in a period of time. Now, if, if, if production was strictly national, if economies were strictly national, then GNP and GDP would be equal because we know a basic principle of national accounting is that production, the amount produced is, is always exactly equal to the aggregate income from production. All the, the amount produced is equal to the amount spent on purchasing those products, and all of that spending is received as income by somebody. So in a closed, perfectly closed economy, GNP and GDP would be equal. But in an economy with payments across borders, they are not. Specifically, GNP equals GDP plus, let's say net, net 
net foreign income. GDP, GNP equals GDP plus net foreign income. So GDP includes the income that people receive as wages, profits, and so on from production in our country, but also the income that we people receive from abroad uh, in, in the form of uh, interest payments, profits, or in some cases, it could be uh, wages it, where, where someone works um, on, lives on one side of the border and works on another side of the border. And this is net, so of course we subtract the payments that are going out the other way. And here, let me pause for a moment because there's a question that you might be feeling already, which is how do we know when we're talking about economic activity, who belongs to which country, who is on which side of the border? Uh, there's basically the general principles that are applied for this. A person, as far as our accounting is concerned, as far as our economic statistics are concerned, a person is part of whatever country they are currently living in. If, if you are basically where, if you, if you have a home, if you are making your home for an extended period of time in a country, then economically you're, you are part of that country. It doesn't, your citizenship status, your immigration status doesn't matter as far as the national accounts are concerned. A person is part of the country they live in. Uh, tourists, travelers uh, are not part of the country they're visiting. They're part of their home country. Uh, and people who, who cross the border simply to work and then return home at the end of the day are, um, are, are um, you know, part of the country that they're, they're, they're sleeping in, not the country they're working in. Of course, there's ambiguous cases. Um, military personnel, for instance, are, are counted as part of the country that they are whose military they're serving in and not the country they're stationed in, even if they are living there. People who work on planes, ships are, are also counted as part of the country that they're, they're based in, even if they may spend an experience. But generally speaking, if you are sleeping somewhere, you're, that's the country you're part of, economically speaking. And as far as businesses go, the same thing is generally true. A business is, is if a business has an office, it's considered to be part of that country, even if it's a subsidiary of a larger business that's based somewhere else. So, um, you know, uh, let's say there's lots of Japanese auto plants in the United States, and the output of those auto plants is, is counted as part of US GDP, although there's, there's, a, there's a wrinkle because the profits they pay back to their Japanese owners are then counted, uh, of course, as an income flow out of this country. But as far as, you know, it's, it, economically, that is, that is, that, that's part of the US economy, even if it's a foreign company that owns it. So, okay, so GNP equals GDP plus net foreign income. So now we can um, go back to some of the, the um, our, our old national accounting identities and add in some elements uh, from here. So we had disposable income, that's, that's disposable income equals total income minus taxes. And now we're going to add net foreign income. I'm just writing income for short, but, but when I write income here, I mean net foreign income. Um, um, actually, maybe maybe it would be clear because income is being, maybe it would be clear. I'm going to instead abbreviate that NFI, net foreign income. Okay, so that's your disposable income. Income from production minus taxes, plus any, the net income being received from abroad. Of course, again, if more income is paid to the rest of the world, then NFI will be negative and that will be a subtraction. Um, now, um, again, we remember we've defined savings as being equal to disposable income minus consumption. And um, so now we can write consumption equals disposable in income minus savings equals total GDP or income minus taxes plus NFI minus S. This is just the same thing. It's just, just, just turning that, the, the, that same equation around. And then we can write our national income identity. And we can then substitute in for C, we can write 
Um, so what I've written here is um, total output equals again government final expenditure plus investment. That's the same. And then this here is just another expression for C. In fact, it's the expression for C that we just wrote up here. Y minus T plus NFI minus S. And then of course, we've still got X minus M. So this is just rewriting our national income identity. And then what we do is we, we're gonna group those terms. We're gonna subtract Y from each side. We've got, we've got you know, a, a, a Y over here and a Y over here. So we can, those can cancel out and we'll write and group, group terms together and we'll write G minus T that a little clearer. Plus plus Sorry, let's make this thing a little bit. Just rewrote that to make it a little clearer. All right, so we've got here G minus T, which is the government surplus, or excuse me, G minus T is the government deficit. G minus T is, is the government deficit or net borrowing by the government equals I minus S, investment minus private savings, which is net borrowing by, this is net borrowing by the private sector. So we've got So, so this is um, net borrowing by government, or let's say public sector. public net borrowing, private net borrowing, and this is foreign net borrowing. Sorry, let's just fix this here. So public net borrowing, obvious enough, it's 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 people, it's the government spending more than it's collecting in taxes. So that's public net borrowing. Private net borrowing, again, it's the private sector investing more than private savings. So the private sector as a whole has to borrow. And this thing, it may be a little less clear why it's foreign net borrowing, but the notion is if we if we take all the goods that we're selling to the rest of the world, if that's greater than the amount that, and, and then you add up. The, the amount of um, our assets that, that, that the foreign sector is buying, um, 
if, I mean, if you add in, you know, the amount of income that we're getting, if, if you add up the amount that we're getting from selling stuff to the rest of the world and the amount of income we're getting from the rest of the world, if we're getting more money from the rest of the world for that stuff than they're getting from us, we must be lending them money. If, if the rest of the world is paying us more in the current period than we are paying them, we have to be lending them money to make up the difference in some form. And similarly, of course, if this thing is negative, then the rest of the world is lending us money. So this is actually, this is, this is a useful little identity. Why did I take the time to do this? Because it's a useful little identity. It lets us think about the kinds of things that are possible to happen in the world. There's a lot of debate, a lot of dispute about exactly what you can and cannot learn from identities like this and how it's, it's, it's appropriate to use them and how it isn't. But certainly it, it is as a matter of accounting, it's true. So at the very least, it tells us there are certain types of outcomes that are true that are possible in certain types of outcomes that are not possible. For instance, if somebody proposes or imagines that the public sector could move towards surplus or at least towards a more balanced budget at the same time that our uh, trade balance improves, they must be assuming that, the, that you're gonna have an increase in net borrowing in the private sector. Either private investment is gonna rise or private savings is gonna fall. Just as a matter of accounting, if, if, if this thing is going down, that would be a movement towards surplus in the public sector. Whoops. Sorry, I think I, miss, I misspoke. For instance, let's, let's put it this way. If, if the pub, public sector is moving towards surplus and we're also going to have a, a um, if the public sector moves towards surplus and our, our um, We, we move towards surplus in our external account, then, then, then it's fine. We don't need to have any change here. The problem would come if you're imagining the public sector moving towards surplus, while at the same time, we're running a bigger trade deficit, then there must be a increase in investment or a decrease in savings in the um, private sector. So, so this, it's a useful tool. And, and for instance, what I just described, and I'm sorry, I, I garbled it the first time, but what I just described is, is for instance, the situation in the United States in the late 1990s. Uh, the government moved, uh, the fiscal balance moved towards into surplus for the first time since, um, uh, you know, since, since, since the 1970s. Meanwhile, the trade deficit got larger, which is, is a negative movement here. So this thing, private net borrowing had to go way up and it did. There was an investment boom and there was also a big decline in private savings, which had the joint effect of causing that this middle term here to go up. And it, it had to, given that you had big public sector surpluses and you had a trade deficit, you had to see more net borrowing by the private sector. So it can be a useful way of sort of thinking about what's going on in the macro economy. And it's at the most sort of general level, it's a way of thinking about the connection between the international position and the sort of um, national accounting framework we use to discuss uh, stuff that happens in the national economy. So now here, this is this is um, an example of this for the for the UK in this case, um, uh, rather than the US, just to mix things up a little bit, um, showing the three three balances: the private balance, uh, the foreign balance, and the government balance. And these things always have to sum to zero because of the accounting I just showed you. And you can see this is a, a symmetrical pattern around that zero line there, but the role played by the different balances is, is quite different. UK movements actually are, are in some ways actually kind of similar to, to those in the United States um, for whatever reason. So you can see here for, for most of this period, um, uh, you know, the red line is rest of the world. The, the, the rest of the world has been lending to the UK which means the UK has been running a trade deficit. If, if the rest of the world is lending to the UK, if the rest of the world has a positive balance, then, um, then uh, that means the, the UK is having a trade deficit there or a current account deficit. The rest of the world is lending to them. That means they have a current account deficit. The private balance you can see is, is sometimes positive, sometimes negative. 
Um, and the government balance in the UK as in the US is almost always negative with also in the UK, just, just an interesting fact that it's sort of similar, also in the UK, a period of um, positive uh, public sector balance in the late 90s. So you can see in, you know, in, in some periods, like let's say the, the, the period of the, uh, the most recent, the, the sort of what we call the Great Recession or global crisis, the government moved way into deficit um, as, as most many governments did trying to stimulate um, uh, demand and the private balance moved way into surplus as businesses reduced investment and households in many cases cut back on um, consumption, but, uh, but especially this, this reflects a reduction in business investment and housing investment, that big movement of the private sector into surplus. So again, a useful set of tools for sort of thinking about um, developments in a real economy. These, these things have to balance out, but different, different sort of things going on in the world are going to lead to different, different balances. All right, so now let's go into a little more detail in the accounts themselves. If you look at the, there, there's slightly different ways of doing this in different countries, but the basic picture is going to look like this. Um, we've, got, uh, we've got the current account. We've got the financial account and we've got, well, we've got the, the capital account here and we've got this thing, statistical discrepancy. So basically up here, in the current account, we've got we've got up we've got train up here we've got transactions that involve payments in the current period but don't directly don't in themselves involve any change in the ownership of an asset. Exports and imports, you're buying a good or service, but a good or a service, you, you buy, it's, it's not counted as an asset in, in, in this sense. It's, it's a current transaction. You know, it doesn't create any assets. Sorry, let's, let me, I should, I should phrase that more precisely. That's not really. These transactions don't create any cross-border as changes in cross-border asset ownership. These transactions don't result in any situation where somebody on one side of the border owns something on the other side of the border, or somebody on one side of the border owes something to someone on the other side of the border. These are transactions as far as their international dimension is concerned, they're done in the current period. This little and economically trivial category involves changes in ownership with no current payment. So this middle, the capital account, things that involve, that result in a change in ownership without any payment being made across borders. So the typical case there would be somebody um, moves, somebody who owns wealth moves from one country to another. If you own, and let's say a rather typical case, um, a wealthy uh, person uh, living in, uh, Egypt, let's say, decides the political climate there is not too favorable and they'd rather, uh, you know, relocate in London. Wealthy people often do prefer uh, to do that. So at that point, they still own perhaps land, perhaps businesses, perhaps financial assets in Egypt. Previously, when they also were in Egypt, those were not counted in any of our international accounts because they didn't have any cross-border component. But if that person is now resident in London, suddenly we have a cross-border position. We now have the asset in Egypt being owned by uh, a unit in, in the UK. So we've created an international ownership position without any payment crossing a border. And that, that's the capital account. Economically, it's trivial, but, but it's, it's always in there. And then the financial account is transactions that involve both a payment across borders and the creation or extinction of uh, a cross-border ownership claim. So let's just talk a little more specifically about what's in here. 
Um, the current account, the biggest item here is trade. Oh, one other, one other very important um, uh, little little bit of, of nomenclature we have to um, introduce here. A couple a couple of general rules for this thing before I talk about them. First of all, any any item in our balance of payments is going to be either a credit or debit item. A credit item is a is a is a payment into the country. A debit So again, if we're imagining a gold standard world, you know, a credit item is one that results in gold flowing in, a debit item is one that results in gold flowing out. That's perfectly obvious and intuitive when we're talking about the current account. Exports are a credit item, imports are a debit item, and so on. It's a little bit confusing with the financial account because things have a little bit, they, they have sort of the opposite sign than you might naively expect. For instance, Incurring a loan, increasing your liabilities to the rest of the world is a credit item because, of course, when you incur a loan, when you borrow money, in the first instance, you get the money that you borrow. That's a credit item. In the same way, selling an asset is a credit item because you get payment for the asset that you sold. A country, on the other hand, that, that is engaged in outward foreign investment, if somebody purchases a financial asset or a business in the rest of the world, that in, counts as a debit item in their home country's accounts because that's a payment out of the country. And the general rule with these things is that for each country, total debits must equal total credits for, at all times. This is, this is a strict accounting. It's like our balance sheets for an individual business, but even stricter because there's no, um, uh, there's no, there's no owner's equity or, or equivalent item here as a balancing item. Total debits must equal total credits for a country. Every transaction that will hold for. And that implies that every transaction that takes place has an element on the financial account. I guess, okay, the exception there is, is the capital. Capital account trans, um, transactions um, don't have an offset. Okay, so apart from the capital account, every, every transaction here is going to have double entries and um, is going to, to involve total credits equal to total debits. Uh, so so the, the, if, you, if, you, if you treat debits as negative and credits as, as positive, that the sum is always going to come to zero. And at least one of those items will be on the financial account. Basically, current account transactions always have a counterpart on the financial account. Financial account transactions might have a counterpart on the current account, or they might have a, a counterpart elsewhere on the financial account. So there are pure financial transactions, but there are no pure current account transactions. And then the other general principle here is that um, uh, the transactions in one country's accounts are going to be, there's going to be a corresponding but opposite transaction in some other country's accounts. Our exports are someone else's imports. Our income receipts are someone else's income payments. Our acquisition of assets is either somebody else's negative acquisition of assets, sale of assets, or someone else's incurring of liabilities, depending on what kind of an asset it is. Uh, but there's always any, any transaction. So in other words, if there is a positive transaction in our current account, there must also be somewhere a negative transaction in our financial account, a negative transaction in someone else's current account, and a positive transaction in someone else's financial account. So they call this quadruple entry bookkeeping. So let me just write that down. It was a little confusing. So again, any transaction that would be show up as a positive entry in our finance, in our current account, anything that would show up as a positive entry in our current account, let's say an export, must also show up as a negative entry in our financial account, a debit in our financial account. How can how can an ex, how can a um, a uh, a uh, an export? Why should an export show up as a as a um, 
a negative entry in our financial account. Well, why, how would that work? Well, I'll get to that. But but for now, just know that's the entry. If there's if there's a credit item, that's the, that's the logic. That's 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 the principle. If there's a positive entry in our current account, there must also be a negative entry in our financial account. There must be a negative entry in someone else's current account. Our export is their import. There must be a debit item in, their, in, in someone else's current account and a credit item in someone else's financial account. One, one transaction is, one current account transaction is always gonna involve these other three as well. Okay, so let's talk about what these things are specifically here. Exports of goods and services, that's pretty straightforward. Goods or services that are produced in one country but purchased in another country. There's, there's the goods piece, there, there's, a, there's some wrinkles in terms of how this is recorded and counted that I'm not gonna get into here, except for one, one very fundamental point, which is once we get into international transactions, we're dealing with different monies, different currencies. So we have to be explicit about which currency things are being recorded in. Now in the US current account, of course, everything is recorded in dollars, typically, but not necessarily, that will be the case with other countries. In other cases, they may be recorded in the national country currency, but they may also be recorded in dollars. So, but in any case, the entries have got, are going to have some explicit currency for them. Um, so, but exports in general, pretty straightforward goods or services. The only the only sort of um, wrinkle I want to I want to mention here is that um, services include a couple of things you might not, along with the sort of obvious stuff a call center operating in one country, but receiving phone calls from another country. That's a pretty common form of trade and services. Uh, air travel is a form of trade and services if the airline is based in one country, but serving passengers in another country. Um, a couple that are, that are not so obvious here, tourism is considered trade and services. So any spending by foreign tourists in the United States is going to show up as a US export of services. And similarly, any spending by um, Americans elsewhere in the world is going to show up as a U.S. import of services, uh, American tourists elsewhere. So that's tourism is going to show up in services. And the other thing that is a little bit odd here is IP fees and licenses. IP fees and licenses also show up as trade and services. Logically, you might think that they would go better under income, but they are not classed there. They are put under services. So any income from royalties, um, patents, and so on is, is counted as uh, export of services. So the US, for instance, is, is a big holder of various IP rights. Uh, American pharmaceutical companies hold patents on drugs that are produced and sold all over the world. Uh, if the drug itself is exported, that's an export of good, but goods. But if a foreign company produces a drug but pays a royalty to the American company that owns the patent, that's an export of services. And um, similarly, American movies, when they're um, shown elsewhere in the world, royalty is paid back to the American company that holds the copyright. That again, shows up as an export of services. Next, uh, we've got here income. Income is divided, it's, it, there's a couple, again, the nomenclature isn't always consistent, but what we see here, the way the BA does it, we have primary income, Primary income is, which is sometimes sometimes just called income, is income that is received because of your ownership of something. So typically the biggest item here is gonna be investment income. Uh, if you own a stock in a foreign company, if you own a bond issued by a foreign government, uh, anything, anything like that, um, and you receive a payment from it, that's going to show up as investment income in the balance of payments. And then there's compensation of employees. When people live in one country, but work in a different country, that shows up uh, there. For the US, not an important category, but for some smaller countries, it is. Again, that wouldn't apply to the thing, you know, migrant labor, people who are not living in the country they're working in, but only people who are basically crossing the border each day for their work or, or you know, those certain special cases like the, uh, uh, you know, the, the people working on ships in international waters or whatever. Um, then we've got, uh, secondary income, which is sometimes called transfers. And that's essentially money paid with no, nothing, nothing offered in return for it, um, no legal right to it. And the big two items here are remittances when people, uh, immigrants 
migrants send money uh, back to family or other people in their home countries and foreign aid of various sorts. Now, each of these items in the current account shows up twice. There's the credit items here, US exports, US income receipts, US uh, transfer receipts, and then the debit items here. So these here are the credit items and these here are the debit items. So, uh, and then you add all those up and that's your current account balance. And then um, again, we got the capital account. I'm not gonna talk anymore about that. The financial account, the key, the key distinction here, there's, there's three big items, three big items in the financial account. First is what we call direct investment assets and liabilities. Oh, first, let me, let me mention a general principle here. What we're seeing in the balance of payments, what we're seeing in the international transaction accounts is the change in all of these positions. We're seeing the change in the net position. So when you see this item here, direct investment assets, that means the net increase in US foreign direct investment abroad, the, the change, the net change in it. So direct investment assets are assets that involve a control, some degree of control over the production process. If you own a foreign business, or if you are a, yourself a multinational and you own a foreign subsidiary, or rather you increase your stake and you either acquire a new foreign subsidiary or you increase your, your investment in a foreign subsidiary, um, that's gonna show as direct investment abroad. Um, if, uh, if, 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 if basically if your ownership of the asset gives you some control over the underlying entity, then, then that's direct investment. Um, so again, a lot of, we think of it sort of canonically as a business having a foreign subsidiary, but, but there's other, other forms it can take. Um, portfolio investment then is ownership of assets that don't give you any control. Ownership of a stock where you're not, you don't have a significant stake. There's a cutoff, I don't remember if it's 10% or maybe it's a higher number, 40%. Right, there's a cutoff they use for how much stock ownership actually gives you sufficient control to turn that into foreign investment. But if you've got a small holding of a foreign stock or a foreign bond, that's gonna be portfolio investment. And then there's this thing, other investment, which you think might be a catch-all category, but it's not. Other investment means bank, bank transactions. It's, it's a little odd that they call it this, but other investment really means bank loans and deposits. So, uh, so basically, when you see a positive value here, US net acquisition of other investment assets, that means one of two things. It means a US bank has made a loan to someone elsewhere in the world, some entity elsewhere in the world. The loan is an asset for the US entity, the bank. So that's a net acquisition of assets. The other possibility is that a US entity, a person or business located in the US has increased their holding of a, has increased their deposits at a foreign bank. Change in a deposit, bank deposit is a kind of asset. If you increase your holding of it, that's gonna show up as a positive entry under net US acquisition. And it's classed under in other investment assets. So a bank deposit is, is not FDI and it's also not a portfolio investment. It's, so, and that other category is really just those two things, bank loans and bank deposits. So, um, and then, you know, you've got the same thing symmetrically down here. So again, these here, now this is again, a little confusing, but these ones are debit items and these ones are credit items. Because again, for instance, a bank that makes a loan to a foreign entity is, 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 is um, you know, um, giving them a, uh, giving them money in a sense, that's what a loan is. So that would be a, a flow of money out of, out of the US. Um, now, in the typical case, you might have the loan if, let's say, the, the borrower holds the proceeds of the loan in a U.S. bank, then we would actually have, well, in that case, we would have two offsetting entries here that wouldn't, um, uh, would, would just cancel each other out. But let's say, let's say a foreign entity issues a bond and then holds the, the proceeds in a U.S. US bank, we would have... Um, Portfolio investment issues upon the United States. Portfolio investment assets acquisition would be positive, assuming this bond was sold to, to Americans. So that would be a debit item. 
Americans are buying the foreign bond. That's a flow of money out of the United States. But if the proceeds from the bond are now held in an American bank, then that would show up down here under other investment liabilities. It's, it's a credit item, it's a liability. A bank deposit is a debt owed by the bank, but it's a credit item because a foreigner increasing their deposits in an American bank, that's a payment of money into the United States. Uh, I know it's confusing, but you know, you just get, you, you, you struggle with it and you try out a few, few sort of sample transactions and you see how the pieces fit together and it starts to make sense. Okay, one, one other piece on here I'm gonna mention once and, and um, not mention again. This thing here, financial derivatives. We know, if we follow the news, we follow what's happening in the world, we know that there is an enormous range of activities carried out by the financial system that do not have anything directly to do with, um, uh, with, with making loans or holding deposits. They don't have anything directly to do with the financing and payment needs of the real economy. All sorts of sort of freestanding financial transactions, what Keynes called the insane gambling casino of modern capitalism. And many of these uh, transactions um, have the form of a sort of two-way debt. I will pay you so much money under these circumstances, you will pay me so much money under those circumstances. We, for instance, have a forward contract where I will sell you so much gold in six months at today's prevailing price. Well, in that situation, it's not obvious who is the uh, creditor and who is the debtor. Um, or it happens even more where you have something like a total return swap. This is, this is a, if people follow the Archegos, or Archegos, I don't know how it's pronounced, the, the, the latest sort of financial implosion on Wall Street, this, this guy running his family office um, who borrowed huge amounts of money from banks to make lots of risky bets and then they went south and he's bankrupt and the banks are in trouble. Anyway, um, what he was doing, a lot of this he called total return swap, which is basically, he's not buying a stock. Instead, he's making a contract with the bank where he will pay them an amount of money equivalent to the price of the stock, and they will pay him an amount of money that would be equivalent to whatever he would have gotten from the stock. Well, the point, the reason I'm bringing this up is it's not clear who's the, uh, who's the creditor and who's the debtor there. Both people are promising flows of money to each other. And so you have to, but these things cross borders. And so you, ha you have to make some effort to try to, at least they do feel they have to make some effort to try to say, well, who on balance is more likely to be making payments to who? And so we get this financial derivatives entry in here, but the numbers in practice are small and the economic interest, as far as I'm concerned is nil. So we will not, we will not talk about that more. I mentioned it because if you look at these things, you will, you will see that line. Okay. So that's, that's sort of the, the structure of this thing. We've got our current account transactions that happen in this period and are done. They do not involve any change in ownership that would carry over to future periods as far as the cross-border, any change in cross-border ownership. The capital account change in cross-border ownership, no payment in the current period, very few. And then these where you've got a payment in the current period that also involves a change in the ownership of an asset or, or, or some new asset position that crosses a border. All right, now, as I said, if you, if you have an actual transaction, you're always going to have four entries in, in except again for those trivial capital account transactions. So for instance, suppose Boeing sells an airplane to uh, Bahrain, a buyer in Bahrain. National Airlines. So let's say they sell it for $10 million. So that shows up here as a credit item, $10 million for in the US under exports of goods and services, exports of goods. But as we said, there have to be four, uh, three other entries. Well, we have over here for Bahrain, $10 million import, a debit item for Bahrain. So that these two correspond to each other. We've got, we've got Imports here correspond, exports here corresponding to imports there. What about the financial transactions here? Well, there, it depends exactly how the payment, one way or another, it will be equal, but it depends how the payment was made. Let's take the simplest case, which is that the, 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 the Bahrain buyer, the airline based in Bahrain, maintains um, a bank account in the United States, 
for this kind of transaction. That would be a standard thing for a company like that to do. They have they have a bank, they, they have deposits that they maintain, they have a bank account they maintain in the United States in order to facilitate making payments in the United States. So in that case, the bank deposit owned by the Bahraini company in the US is a liability for the United States because a bank deposit, again, is a debt from the bank to the customer, to the depositor. So a bank deposit made by the Bahraini customer, made, made, maintained by a Bahraini business, is a liability for the United States, an asset for the United for, for Bahrain. Now, when they spend down that deposit, when they reduce that deposit, they are reducing the size of that bank account. They're reducing that position. So what we would get down here is other investment liabilities would be going down by 10 million. And again, confusingly, net incurrence of liabilities is a credit item. So reducing this credit item on the financial account, increasing this credit item in the current account, you get a net change of zero. And of course, over here in Bahrain, other investment assets includes foreign bank accounts. So this would go down by 10 million. So that balances out, um, uh, gives us our full set of transactions. Obviously, they might pay for it in other ways. We could imagine more complicated transactions. Um, but but that would be that would be sort of the simple simplest case where the payment is made um, from a an account in a U.S. bank. Uh, okay, moving on. So let's take a look now at what these items actually look like for the contemporary United States. Uh, and you know, other countries are going to have different ones. So you'll see I've given this in millions of dollars, which is how they are reported by the BEA, and as percent of GDP, which is a much more meaningful and informative way of reporting them for most purposes. So what do we see here? Well, first of all, we can see the US, although the US is one of the least globalized economies in the world. The US is, is, is among the world's economies. The US has one of the smallest fractions of trade. You know, the, the only other economies, major economies, I mean, not counting North Korea and whatever, that, that have as little foreign trade as the US are like Brazil and Japan, interestingly enough. Um, but most, most, in most economies in the world, trade accounts for a considerably larger part of GDP than it does in the US. Now, historically, you know, if you go back 100 years, the numbers for the US were much smaller, you know, a few percent. But even today, exports are about 15% of US GDP. About 15% of, of US production is, is purchased by the rest of the world. And we can see that, that, that those exports consist Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. That's that's actually the whole exports of goods and services and income receipts. I'm sorry. It's actually 10%. 10%. This is this is 2020. 2020 is such a weird year. I mean, it's the most current number, so I'm using 2020 is such a year, weird year. 10% of U.S. GDP exported in 2020. That's a really low number. That's that's an unusually low number. Usually, usually it's 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 several points higher than that. But anyway, we'll look at that. Exports of goods and services. In 2020, last year from the US, 10% of GDP, 10% of what was produced in the US was, was purchased abroad. And you can see about two thirds of that was goods. $1.4 billion worth of goods sold abroad, amounting to about 7% of US GDP and about one third of our exports, $700 billion, $700 billion, three, three and a third uh, percent of GDP is services. Uh, services, we could go into this, but there's there's a lot of things in there. Um, you know, travel, tourism, IP related stuff. There, there's a lot of different different items under services, but, but in any case, about a third of US exports consist of services. Uh, then we'll, we'll come back to the income account. If we look at imports, we can see they're quite a bit uh, quite a bit high, well, 13%, sorry, 13.5%. Imports are 13.5% of GDP. And you can see there, imports are predominantly goods. 11% of GDP in goods imports, only 2% of GDP in services imports. So the US is, is, is proportionally more of a service exporter. In fact, if you compare these numbers, 3.3 and 2.2, you can see the US has a trade surplus on services even though it has a trade 
deficit overall. Now, if we look at income, we see the US receives 4.5% of GDP in investment income from the rest of the world. Compensation of employees, $6 billion, doesn't even get you to one tenth of a percent of GDP. For the US, that is not an, a significant item. And then on the other side, you see um, investment income paid out to the rest of the world is 3.6%. So the US receives more investment income from the rest of the world than it pays to the rest of the world, which is actually, as we'll see in a moment, really interesting and important fact about the US in particular, because the US is a big net debtor to the rest of the world. If you look at how much assets the US owns in the rest of the world and how much the rest of the world owns in the US, the rest of the world owns a lot more here. And yet, nonetheless, the US gets more income from its foreign assets than it pays out on its foreign liabilities. And you can see the compensation of foreigners working in the US just, just breaks over 10th of a percent of GDP. Again, not a very important number. And then um, secondary income transfer payments um, uh, coming into the US are 0.7, not very big, going out of the US 1.4. That's not surprising. Remittances are much more likely to be going out of the US than into it, but both small numbers. So, you know, if you're looking at the US current account balance, the big numbers obviously are, are trade, with most of that trade being in goods, but a significant chunk of US exports being services. And then investment income is, is not tiny and, and is, is on balance flowing into the US rather than out of the US. Capital transfers, as you can see, again, not even a tenth of a percent. Forget about those, don't matter. And then we get we get down to the financial account. Well, this this one, these items tend to bounce around more than the um, uh, than the than the than the um, uh, than the current account items do. But let's in 2020, you can see the U.S. acquired assets abroad. The US increased its holdings of foreign assets by 3.6% of GDP, but the rest of the world increased their holdings of US assets by 7.2% of GDP. So there's flows of lending and borrowing going in both directions. That's that's pretty normal around the world. It's, you know, except in maybe in very poor countries where those flows are, are mostly inward, but even there, it's they aren't necessarily. I mean, yeah, maybe, maybe in very poor countries those flows would be mostly inward, but in general, you have lots of big financial flows going in both directions. And then we can see, you know, in this particular year, most of the uh, financial flows out of the U.S. took the form of portfolio investment. About half, well, about half of them portfolio investment, and then you know the rest divided between direct investment, pretty small number in that year, and this other investment. And then on the other side of the flows into the U.S., portfolio investment again is the biggest. Other is, is clearly number two. And direct investment into the U.S. Is, is relatively small. So again, this item here, this other inward investment um, reflects some, is, is primarily an increase in foreigners' deposits at U.S. banks. And perhaps secondarily, um, foreign banks' loans to U.S. companies. Okay, two final items before we move on here. Reserves, this item is not important for the US. Oh, sorry, I, I circled the wrong one. Reserve assets here, zero. The US neither acquired nor got rid of any, any noticeable amount of reserve assets. The reserves are not an important concept for the US. Reserves are assets held by the government, typically by the central bank, as basically a precautionary um, uh, measure in order to make sure that the country can smoothly make its international payments. Uh, they're, they're that way, if, if, if you have to pay, you know, if your exports fall for some reason, if your foreign interest payments rise for some reason, if for whatever reason the balance of payments is moving adversely, if there's a, if there's a tendency for flows out of the country to increase or for flows into the country to decrease, you can manage that without any more painful adjustment if you have a holding of reserves that you can you can pay down when you need to when the balance of payments turns negative or accumulate when the balance of payments turns positive. Not important at all for the U.S. Very important in many other parts of the world. And we've got a statistical discrepancy because when you're measuring numbers in the real world, the, the numbers never add up perfectly. And then finally, you can see numbers that people pay a lot of attention to: the current account balance, three percent. So in a sense, the US borrowed 3% of GDP from the rest of the world in 2020, and the trade balance, 3.3% US imported more than it exported to the tune of three and a third percent of GDP last year. <laughs>
Now this again, just I mentioned that other investment item is all bank transactions here. You can just see that when we zoom in on more detail of, of, of that, you know, if you go back, you see um, other investment liabilities here. And then we dig down into, um, hmm, I, must have, I must have picked a different, uh, the numbers don't match up. I must have picked a different, different period for this one. Well, it doesn't matter, the proportions would be the same. This other investments, you can see most of it is bank deposits. Most of the increase in US foreign other liabilities is simply foreign businesses and perhaps people um, increasing their holdings, their deposits at US banks. And then the smaller item here is loans, which is American borrowings from foreign banks. And this other, the other, the other actual like other stuff in here is either not even measured or, or, or tiny. Special drawing rights. Uh, we, we'll talk about those a little bit later. People think they're interesting. They're not important in the modern world. Uh, okay, moving on. Let's just look at the same picture over time. You can see that the, the pattern is somewhat consistent, although there, there's certainly some variation here. But you can see that over the last five years, the US has consistently, consistently run a trade surplus in services. Now we're, we're getting these in billions of dollars, but you can see the US has, uh, has you know, consistently been running surpluses in services of 50, $60 billion a year. And the US consistently receives more primary income, more investment income from the rest of the world than it pays out, again, to the tune of 50 or $60 billion a year. On the other hand, the trade deficit in services is, there's been a trade deficit in goods I mean, there's been a trade deficit in goods going back to the late 1970s. The U.S. has not um, had a, a trade uh, trade surplus since since the late 70s, and uh, services were were a pretty trivial part of it uh, back then. So, um, so the the uh, deficit in goods is is large and longstanding. And again, you would see basically the same picture if you went back further. Um, and secondary income, foreign aid and remittances also, also consistently negative, although not very big. So the consistent result of that is a negative current account. Although you can also see that the 2020 current account gap or deficit was, was unusually large. And that really reflects the collapse in US exports during 2020. And I, we, could, we could dig in a little more and see exactly what was involved there. You know, is that a lot of that tourism? Is it other things? But in any case, US exports fell pretty drastically in 2020 with the result that this goods deficit got bigger and the current account balance went more negative. So this, it's again, this is presenting the same accounting categories we saw before in a very simple aggregated way, but then looking at, at them over time. We can slice things up in other ways if we want. And of course we can do this. Every country in the world has a, a balance of payments. Every country in the world has something reported for its international investment position. Um, you know, we may or may not believe the numbers in every case, but but there's certainly, you, you're gonna be able to find something. So this is, um, this is from Brad Setzer, really interesting guy. He was a, many years had a blog at the Council on Foreign Relations, which was one of the most informative things you could read about international payments and the international economy. Unfortunately, well, not unfortunately, but unfortunately, from the point of view of blog consumers, he uh, he's now um, part of the Biden administration, so he's not blogging anymore. But he did he did a lot of, of good stuff on this, um, and this is just one of his graphs, which is just breaking up the Chinese current account surplus. China sort of famously has been running large current account surpluses for quite a number of years, and he's just saying, well, where where is that coming from? And you can break you can you can slice things up in lots of ways. That's the beautiful thing about accounting. But here, what we see is um, you know, China's overall current account is the red line here, which you can actually see when he made this at the end of 2018 was actually coming pretty close to balance. Um, you can see that the, the surpluses are really uh, driven by uh, goods, trade in goods, that's this pinkish line here, and in particular trade in manufactured goods, where China, you know, at one point was, selling manufactured goods abroad on the, on the order of 12% of GDP, which is, is, is pretty impressive. Um, uh, that's a surplus. They were not selling, they were, they were selling quite a bit more. They had a surplus of 12% of GDP, which is pretty extraordinary. Um, so manufactured goods are where the big surplus is. 
then you can see other than manufactured goods, there aren't any surpluses. China, of course, is an importer of primary products. That means um, basically natural, natural resources, fossil fuels, coal and oil, number one, but also food and, and, and other you know, wood. Um, consistently a deficit there. And um, the tourism balance has been negative. Um, Chinese tourists travel abroad uh, more than Americans and other and Europeans travel to China. Also, this is where uh, China has, it's, it's an interesting thing and, and I hope we'll get to talk about it a little more. China is one country that's maintained effective capital controls, meaning the government has pretty tight restrictions on financial transactions across the border. And if you are a wealthy person in China, in general, you do not have the legal right to take your wealth out of the country. You, you may own you know, a billion dollars of stock in your company in China. And you might say, I'd like to sell some of this stock and deposit the proceeds in a bank in New York or London or, or, or in Switzerland. You can't do that. It's against the law. You'll go to jail. Maybe you'll be shot. So uh, you can't do it, but you can do other things. For instance, you can say, um, I'm going to take a vacation in one of those places and I and report that you spent an enormous amount of money on fancy stuff when actually you deposited that money in a bank account. Uh, another thing that happens, you know, wealthy Chinese families, this has been cracked down a bit, but they would they would send their kids to school in the US or in Canada and say, well, my kid needs a place to live while they're there. And then you buy an extremely expensive, you know, apartment in Manhattan or Vancouver. And, and you say it's for your kid to live in, it's really a form of investment. Anyway, the point is tourism is where um, uh, outward financial flows get hidden, but there also is real spending there. Anyway, that's negative. Chinese tourists spending more money abroad. So we could do, we can do these sorts of exercises for lots of lots of countries, but the, the important point is, is that we can, you know, the numbers have to add up, but we can split them up in lots of different ways. So when we see this current account number, we can ask, well, where is that coming from? Is it coming from trade? Um, is it coming from trade in goods? Is it coming, you know, wh 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 which, which piece of that account is, 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 is responsible for the surplus? Okay, moving on, um, the international investment position. So this is like the balance sheet for, um, for a country. Just as a business or a household has a balance sheet showing how much they own and how much they owe, a country can have, you can drop a similar balance sheet. So as I mentioned now for the, in the US, the balance sheet items correspond to the financial account items that I mentioned before. So we've got assets and liabilities and each assets and liabilities are divided into our direct investment. Again, where, the, where you actually got control over the asset being exercised or control over the, the company or business or production process you know, that, 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 that's attached to the asset exercised across the border, portfolio investment where there's no control, just, just a purely financial arrangement and other, which is bank loans and deposits. So you can see here, the US has a, a large negative um, net international investment position. This is $14 trillion because the values here are in millions. That's how they report them. So this is $14 trillion, which is about two thirds of US GDP is, is the net for US foreign debt to the rest of the world, which some people get agitated about and worried about, but as, I, as we saw earlier, despite that the US actually receives more investment income from the rest of the world than it pays out. The US, if you like, is paying negative interest on its borrowing from the rest of the world. Most countries aren't so lucky. Uh, that net negative 14 trillion position is the sum of two larger gross positions, US assets. The US owns $32 trillion worth of stuff in the rest of the world while the rest of the world owns $46 trillion worth of stuff here in the US. US foreign investment consists of about $9 trillion of foreign direct investment, about $14.5 trillion of portfolio investment. Well, the derivatives here are not, are not trivial here, but we're not gonna try to make sense of those. And $5 trillion of other investment, which is gonna consist primarily of US banks lending to foreign companies and also foreign deposits um, held by, by US entities. And then on the other side, we've got $46 trillion of foreign investment in the US consisting of $12 trillion of FDI, inward FDI, US operating businesses own abroad. So, you know, those Japanese auto plants all over the South, for example, but lots of other stuff too. Lots of US real estate owned by the rest of the world. Anything where, where the ownership carries control rights is in here, $12 trillion. A larger amount, 
25 trillion of portfolio investment, again, these mystery derivatives, and then $7 trillion of other investment, which in this case is gonna consist primarily of foreign entities deposits at US banks. So that's the overall, overall US position. Now in principle, in principle, we should say that the change you would think that the change in the international investment position should equal the current account balance. Your total debt is equal to the total amount that you borrow over time, just add it up over year. This would be an example of a stock flow consistent relationship when the change in the stock is equal to the relevant flow. Current account being a flow, this being a stock. These are all stock values here. Okay, so, um, uh, you would think that the change in the international investment position would be equal to the current account balance. And so every year where you have a current account deficit, your international investment position gets uh, more negative. And every year you have a current account surplus, your international investment position gets more positive. But that is not the case because of valuation changes. If the US let's say US liabilities to the rest of the world have gone up. It could be because somebody in the rest of the world lent money to a US entity or purchased an asset in the United States. That could be one reason why liabilities to the rest of the world went up, but it could also be because the existing liabilities increased in value. And how would that happen? Well, there are two ways. The value of the asset changes which is, is, is really important for equity, for stock ownership. Foreigners own a lot of US stocks and Americans own quite a bit of foreign stocks. Those things are valued as liabilities for the country where the, where the stock issuing company is located at whatever the current value of the stock is. In other words, if a foreigner owns shares in Amazon, a foreign company, a foreign financial institution, typically or a foreign individual owns shares in Amazon, when Amazon's shares increase in value, the value of the liability for the United States increases. In other words, a million dollars of Amazon shares owned by a bank in Luxembourg is in, counted up here as a US portfolio liability to Luxembourg. It's, it's counted as a million dollars that the US owes to Luxembourg. If those shares increase to $2 million, then the value of that liability, the value of the US debt to Luxembourg represented by those shares also goes up to $2 million. So changes in the value of equity and to a lesser extent land can cause these portfolio numbers to really bounce around in ways that have nothing to do with the current account balance, that have nothing to do with the country running a surplus or deficit. In general, when a company, country's assets increase in value, its foreign liability is going to increase in, val in, in value because some of those assets are owned by foreigners. And if we have a lot of investment, if Americans have a lot of investment in some part of the world, and that part of the world sees an increase in the value of assets, Americans net assets are going to increase in value. So that's one. The other, the other form of valuation changes, oops, the other form of valuation changes is, um, are those associated with exchange rate changes. Because, and I mentioned this early in this lecture, if you remember all the way back towards the beginning of this lecture, when I said everything in these accounts is denominated in a currency. So far, we've been talking about everything in dollars and we've been able to ignore that, but not everything is actually measured in dollars. For instance, if the US, if an American business owns a, let's say, or let's say an American financial institution, let's say they, they've got a big position in, 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 the, in the German stock market for whatever reason, you know, just for diversification reasons or they're specialist investors or they're making a bet. Anyway, big US financial institution ownership of German stocks. Well, that we know, of course, is gonna be um, part of US assets, portfolio assets up here. Okay, no, sorry, I circled direct assets. It's gonna be up here, part of this side, part of that $15 trillion of portfolio investment. If the German stock market goes up, fine, the value of that asset increases. 
if the value of the euro goes up relative to the dollar, the value of that asset also increases. German stocks are valued in euros. German land is valued in euros. So if the euro goes up relative to the dollar, the value of America's holdings of German assets also goes up and the international investment position will, for the US will appear to become more positive. So it really makes a difference whether your assets or liabilities or both are denominated in your own currency or if they're denominated in a foreign currency. For the US, our assets are largely foreign currency denominated because a stake in a foreign business or in ownership of a foreign asset is, is typically valued at in the currency that where that where that asset is located. Our liabilities are almost entirely um, denominated in dollars. Every US, every bond, I, I, I shouldn't say every, nothing is every, every, but the, the vast, vast majority of bonds issued by American businesses and 100% of the bonds issued by the US government are denominated in dollars. And of course, US uh, stock is, is denominated in dollars, pays out dividends measured in dollars. So when the dollar increases in value, the US debts to the rest of the world increase in value. When the dollar goes down in value, US debts to the rest of the world go down in value. And this is, this is another sort of way in which the US is privileged, what we call sometimes the exorbitant privilege of the US as the issuer of the world currency, because other countries, that's not necessarily the case. Many governments around the world and many businesses around the world borrow in dollars. So when those countries' currency uh, declines in value, the value of those uh, of those liabilities actually goes up. If you're a foreign, if you're a country that has significant, let's say, here we are in the U.S. We've got this this stuff: 117 percent, 118 percent of GDP in portfolio investment, uh, inward portfolio investment, our liability. Exchange rate changes are not going to affect this number at all, because value of GDP goes down, value of the liability measured in dollars goes down. It's a wash. For us, the exchange rate effects are happening over here. But for a country where their liabilities or some significant fraction of their international liabilities are denominated in dollars, if their currency gets weaker, the value of those liabilities measured relative to their economy goes up. If you are, let's say, Mexico in 1995 and you've just signed NAFTA and your government and many of your private businesses have issued large amounts of debt payable in dollars and foreign investors suddenly get spooked and decide they don't want to hold peso denominated assets. And actually in this particular case, and in many cases, but certainly in this one, actually your, your own domestic rich people, wealthy Mexicans decide they really would rather not be holding their wealth in pesos if they can help it. They would much rather have a bank account in New York. So peso denominated assets are getting sold, dollar denominated assets are getting bought, supply and demand, peso goes down and down, the dollar goes up in value. And suddenly all that dollar denominated debt that has been issued in Mexico is much, much harder to pay back. Very big problem for Mexico in 1995, very big problem for many countries around the world before and since then, not a problem for the United States. So here, now you can see this uh, illustrated in this, in this picture here. This, this is showing in red our, our current account balance here. This is this is the current account. You can see it's 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 consistently we go back to 1975. So you can see you go back to 1975. It's positive. It's actually a little blip into positive territory here in 1991, which is kind of an interesting reason for that. Uh, but uh, well, I guess I have to explain why. The U.S. did not run a trade surplus in 1991. The U.S. did not has not run a trade surplus since the late 1970s. The U.S. ran a very big surplus on the income account in 1991. Not the primary income account, not investment income. On that secondary income account, that net transfer account in 1991, there was a huge volume of net transfers into the United States. Remember, that term is normally negative for the United States. Normally, we have foreign aid that's going out of the United States. We have remittances going out of the United States. That, that secondary income or transfer account is normally negative for the United States. But in 1991, the transfer balance was large and positive. Why? Well, what else was happening in 1991? You might remember the first Gulf War. You might remember George H.W. Bush and his, his, his uh, decision to invade Iraq. Uh, 
And you might remember that unlike his son, he managed to put together a substantial international coalition to support that invasion. And some of those coalition members sent troops, but many of those coalition members sent money. So this little blip into positive territory for the US current account represents the profitability of US war making in that one particular instance, you might say. The ability of the US to generate substantial payments from foreign governments to offset the costs of carrying out this military adventure. Anyway, interesting little story right there. But in general, the US current account has been negative and it's been negative in a range of three to five, two to 5% of GDP for quite a long time. So if, if we've had a sort of stock flow consistent world where the change in the in the in the where where you know the change in the international investment position was uh, equal to the current account balance, we would accept expect to see this thing sloping down sort of gently, you know, over or at two or three percent a year. So you would you would expect um, uh, you know to go from you know let's say uh, where we're at zero if it's going at two or three percent of the year then by you know, by, by in 10 years, it should be down, you know, at negative 25, sort of like this. Well, the actual slope is not so different from that. So you might say actually over the long run, things are kind of stock flow consistent, maybe. Anyway, yeah, if it was just the current account, we might expect to see a, a downward slope like that. And maybe on average we do, but we sure see a lot of variation around that. And one reason for that is, is because of the variation in the value of the dollar. So this, this black line is the dollar, the value of the dollar, it's shown over here on the right scale. And you can see, okay, let's for instance, consider the late nineties. US current account got a little more negative, but the US investment position went down steeply. Well, what was happening then? The value of the dollar was going up. Remember, US liabilities denominated dollars, US assets denominated in foreign currencies. So when the dollar gets stronger, the US international investment position gets worse because our debts are worth the same. They're still denominated in dollars, but our assets are worth less because those foreign currencies are worth less relative to the dollar. Now then look at this, look in the mid 2000s. The, the current account deficit gets even bigger. This is, this, this is you know, over 5%, the biggest current account deficit in, in, in modern US history, probably since World War II. Um, and yet the international investment position is going, is going up. It's becoming more favorable. The US is ending up owing less to the rest of the world. Well, why? Because the dollar is getting weaker, much weaker during that period, which means our debts to the rest of the world are worth less relative to our assets that we own in the rest of the world. So even though we've got these big current accounts, the international investment position becomes more positive. And then, you know, in the, in, the, in the recession of a decade ago, what we used to call the Great Recession, I don't know if we're gonna go on calling it that, uh, the current account balance moved towards zero. And incidentally, that always happens in recessions. Well, I shouldn't say always, that happens very consistently in recessions. You know, you can see it very clearly in the late 80s. You can see it clearly here. It didn't, didn't happen so much in that uh, recession around 2000. But in general, the current account balance becomes more positive in recessions. So, uh, so the current account balance, and then we still got a deficit here, but the deficit is a lot smaller. And yet the international investment position is going steeply downward. Well, why? The dollar in this period is strengthening. And then what about this dive off of the deep end down here? What's going on there? It's true, the US is still running current account deficits, but the deficits did not get particularly larger. And yet the downward movement of the international investment position really accelerated. The reason for that is because the stock market is booming. A lot of the portfolio investment by the rest of the world in the US consists of stock ownership. As I mentioned before, the value of US stock goes up. The value of the liability that the US owes to the foreign owners of that stock also goes up. The notion True or false, but the notion that underlies the accounting is that the value of the stock in some sense represents the future flow of dividends that the company is going to pay on that stock. So if the value of Amazon stock goes up, that implies that the US is going, the Amazon is going to be paying more dividends. And to the extent that stock is owned in the rest of the world, it means more dividends are going to flow out of the rest of the US to the rest of the world. And therefore, in a sense, the US owes more to the rest of the world. So yes, this, this final you know, dive of the, of the international investment position reflects the fact that the US is experiencing a historic stock market boom and the countries that we invest in generally are not. 
so yes, yeah, so for other countries, they, these things might line up. And again, you know, if you said, well, over a period of 30 years, you know, the slope here doesn't look too different from what you would see if it was all driven by the current account. Well, maybe, but, but certainly over shorter periods, these valuation changes are, are dominating the movements in the, in the international investment position. So the final slide. Uh, I mentioned earlier reserves, not important for the US, very important for the rest of the world. Reserves are assets that are um, essentially held typically by a central bank. It could be some other uh, part of the government in, well, reserve in order to guarantee your ability to make payments in an emergency. Um, and one way of thinking about reserves is as a, as a balancing or accommodating item. If we add up all the private transactions in the economy, uh, the financial flows in and out, the trade flows in and out, the income flows in and out, and they don't balance out, then the leftover will show up in the reserve account. Now that's only true if the, if the government is actively buying and selling reserves. The US government doesn't, but many other countries do. Many other countries, if they see, for instance, that they are not exporting enough to make payments on their foreign debt, they'll spend down their reserves rather than risk having their uh, exchange rate perhaps depreciate un un unpredictably or uncontrollably, uh, which wouldn't perhaps help the situation anyway. Or similarly, if they see that they're exporting more, their export net exports are greater than, than their um, private sector feels like investing abroad or then, or then they want to let their private sector invest abroad, then the, the difference can be uh, accumulated as reserves. So what this is showing, this is, this is um, through an article by Jörg Bibel, who's a very, very interesting guy on this stuff. But um, uh, basically, if we go back to the 1990s, we see that a lot of the what called emerging market economies, you know, newly industrializing countries, you know, particularly think of sort of Korea, uh, Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia, uh, were running current account deficits, trade deficits mostly, but certainly current account deficits. Oh, incidentally, the scales here, the scales here are the same, but the, the, the scale for reserves, which is, you know, the green bars is reversed. So the, the, the negative lines here are um, reserve accumulation, increase in reserves. Uh, so, so, I don't know why you did that. Anyway, you can see it, it creates a balance between the stuff up here and the stuff down here. Anyway, so this is a current account deficit. However, at the same time, they were experiencing major inflows of foreign investment. In the 90s, you know, foreign uh, capital markets, foreign financial markets, foreign investment flows are extremely flighty and unpredictable. There are large pools of money, you know, eager to be invested somewhere in the world. And in the mid 1990s, somewhere in the world really meant South, uh, East and Southeast Asia. So, uh, so there were large financial inflows. There were also large current account deficits, but the financial inflows were larger than the deficits. So these countries were accumulating foreign exchange reserves. Now, then we had what was called the Asian crisis in 1997, where suddenly these financial inflows stopped and reversed. Here you see this line remains positive, but this is for emerging market economies in general. If you looked at Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, for them, that red line would have gone well into negative territory. Uh, rather than receiving financial inflows, they were uh, receiving financial outflows as foreigners, as well as a lot of domestic wealth holders, were desperately selling the assets in those countries and trying to acquire assets in, in, in Western Europe and the United States. So you had this fall there. The countries then were in part forced to move into surplus, in part by deep, deep, deep recessions, deep depressions, mass unemployment in, in all of these countries that did have the effect of moving them into surplus. In order to avoid having that happen again, they then adopted policies designed to allow them to continue to run trade surpluses um, uh, going forward. And so these countries that had previously been, been running persistent current account deficits began running large current account surpluses. But they also continued receiving inflows of foreign investment. That's this red line here, with the result that their reserves rose by, by a lot. So you can see here that the, the, basically the sum of the blue and the red lines is going to be equal to the green line. Because if we take, again, it's, it's accounting. Everything ends up somewhere. If we take 
all of our current account flows and we take all of our private financial flows, what's left over is reserves. In the US, that reserves item is trivial, but here you can see it's extremely large. Uh, for, for this for this set group of countries as a group, you know, if you go back to the mid 2000s, they were um, had trade surpluses in the aggregate on the order of $600 billion. They had um, foreign exchange uh, financial inflows in some years as high as $600 billion. And they were accumulating reserves on the order, therefore, of, of $1.2 trillion. That's just how it works. That's how the accounting works. So, so these, these, these large trade surplus or current account surpluses combined with continued large inflow, financial inflows led to very large accumulation of reserves. And then he's put China on here. You can see that about half of these uh, current account surpluses are due to China, more in some years, less in other years, but there's substantial surpluses in the non-China non countries as well. So in a, lot of, in a lot of the world, not the US at all, and not in the Euro area for different reasons that we could get into, in the Euro area reserves are not a thing, but, uh, but in, in, in most of the world outside of the US and the Euro area, uh, reserves are very important. Reserves consist of essentially central banks holding of typically government bonds, mostly denominated in dollars. Typical reserve holdings are you know, two thirds or 70% dollars, meaning treasury debt. Most of the borrowing the US uh, government does. Uh, in fact, to some, I, I think you could make a case all of it on net ends up being held as by foreign central banks as reserves, at least not maybe not in the last, most, last couple of years, but certainly in, in many years, the foreign purchases of foreign increases in reserve holdings have exceeded the total borrowing by the US government. Uh, so, and then some of it yen, yeah, some of it euro, pretty much only those three currencies. Um, uh, so these reserves, um, and then gold, I mean, if you look, for instance, the US has a little item of reserve holdings in our, you know, if we go all the way back, um, oops. Yeah, here, um, this thing here, 600, and, uh, 600 million odd uh, reserve assets for the US, it's almost all gold, it's mostly gold. So gold comes in there. Gold isn't really very important in the world, but it still is held by central banks as a reserve asset. And, and for many countries in the world, the, the, the amount of reserves they hold changes in the reserve holdings are very important um, economic variable. And as you can see here, they're really, in this case, you know, a decisive balancing variable for other flows, which otherwise would not add up. Balance of payments has to balance. And typically if you have a current account surplus and a financial inflow, those things aren't balancing, which is is where you get all of these all of these reserves being held. And and uh, you know, people, for instance, look at China and say, oh, they're manipulating their currency. But I I personally think because they're buying dollars and selling yen, I I think a, probably a better way of looking at it is they, given that they are running a large trade surplus, and given that they do not allow. Um, Chinese residents to buy assets in the rest of the world, and given that foreign companies want to buy assets in China, they're going to get a net inflow on their balance of payments, and that has to end up somewhere, so it ends up in reserves. It ends up in China purchasing treasury bonds, not in order to manipulate their currency, but simply because they have to do something with the foreign exchange inflows that are, that are coming into the country. But that, that's a subject that is, um, is, is really controversial. So I'm I'm going to end uh, end there, and future 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 um, future lectures will talk about you know what drives these these flows and causes them to change, for instance, in in dramatic ways like that.